So uh, this is an image. Uh, what I'm going to talk about uh, primarily is uh, give you an update of what we've been doing with the uh, Tempest uh, unmanned aircraft system that was uh, introduced during uh, Vortex 2 back in 2010, 2009, 2010. Um, and this is an image here of, uh, from that time with the Tempest coming home after a mission in uh, near, uh, if I recall, McCook, Nebraska uh, during part of that deployment. So um, to give you an idea of how operations occur, this is a, an example uh, from uh, 2013 when uh, our team intercepted, sorry, our team uh, intercepted a, um, a gust front from a um, storm that had produced a tornado, uh, or a cluster of storms that produced a tornado over Denver International uh, Airport. And just to give you an idea of how, how we launch, uh, the, the Tempest uh, weighs about 12 pounds, has a 10 and a half foot wingspan, and about an hour, in its current configuration, about an hour of endurance. Um, and so as you see there, when it's taken off, it, it has a mist, uh, 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 basically an RS-90, uh, Vaisla RS-92 son under one wing. The other wing, it has a, um, um, a uh, aeroprobe, uh, five-hole multi-hole probe for doing wind measurements. And so this is uh, in the Pawnee National Grassland. There's a steady wind. They're blowing at about 40, uh, 40, uh, 40 miles per hour coming out of that, uh, that gust front. So this is the team here uh, that has um, continued to, uh, to work together. Uh, to the left, you see that um, at CU, the expertise there is uh, primarily uh, with the unmanned aircraft system. Um, uh, our, my colleague, uh, Adam Houston, uh, who's here in the, in the audience at uh, University of Nebraska-Lincoln, um, uh, you know, he's bringing in this, the storm scale modeling. And when we deploy, he's, he's usually the one who's in, in, uh, in charge of uh, directing where the aircraft uh, should be deployed and where to go. Uh, uh, Chris uh, Weiss at Texas Tech uh, with KA uh, radar, uh, mobile radar, and uh, we'll show you some uh, results from some of uh, deployments with them. And on at least one occasion um, with uh, one of the cases I'll talk about is uh, Conrad Ziegler. And, um, from the National Severe Storms Lab uh, has also deployed with us, along with uh, Sean Waugh, who uh, is also at the lab. So uh, what we've been doing since uh, the deployments in, in 2010 uh, has been primarily funded by the Air Force, uh, by the uh, Office of Scientific uh, Research, AFOSR. And what they're interested in um, is this idea of, an, of us developing an energy aware uh, dynamic data-driven application system. So the DDDAS uh, that uh, you often hear uh, discussed. And so one of the things we noticed that was during our deployments and uh, supercell deployments, there were frequent times when the Tempest would, uh, the autopilot would literally turn off the throttle and it would still track the, uh, uh, the ground vehicle that was leading it to the storm. Uh, in order to meet the FAA requirements that we have an observer, uh, with eyes on the aircraft at all times, we have a uh, uh, basically an SUV with uh, graduate students and, and, and meteorologists, uh, graduate students, who are driving towards the storm. So uh, if there's a tornado on the ground, it's safer for our graduate students to drive toward the storm. <laughs> no, that's okay. So, uh, so the, the aircraft is actually tracking the ground vehicle. And, um, and so one of the things we realized is that uh, there were opportunities to harvest energy from the uh, from the environment. And so that's what this work is about, is developing a smart aircraft that uh, uh, will plan its path, um, obviously in the future when it doesn't have to track a ground vehicle, but will plan its path to best uh, get to the target where it can harvest energy along the way. And so this is, these are the components of, uh, of that system, and our, it brings together our expertise in, in remote sensing, in situ sensing, and atmospheric modeling. So this is just an example of a KA uh, radar uh, near Lubbock, Texas, a dry line, and showing the high resolution that they're able to get uh, uh, during this uh, a deployment in uh, this. We, we were not deploying the aircraft with this, with this uh, uh, during this, but this is uh, an example of the, the high resolution. And the, the Air Force is not so much interested in us uh, tracking storms. They're interested in us looking at various atmospheric features, uh, some as small as what you see here, and being able to exploit those for, uh, uh, for providing energy 
uh, for the for the flight. Uh, at uh, Nebraska, this is um, uh, Adam Houston's um, role in this is to uh, is developing the atmospheric models uh, for uh, for the planning these AMOPs and ranging from you can see there in in, in terms of complexity, ranging from a simple translation type of model up to one that's fully predicting the uh, 3D wind field. And this is a schematic of, uh, of, how, of how this works uh, with the uh, uh, ingesting the radar data along with the in situ data coming from the aircraft and then uh, using that to uh, produce a forecast product su such that the aircraft then can, can uh, better plan its path. So ultimately, um, and my colleague uh, Eric Fru at the uh, University of Colorado uh, Boulder, who is the uh, director of our uh, research uh, center there um, um, in UAS, um, his role in this is to actually develop the algorithms for uh, the aircraft to plan its optimal trajectories. And so uh, basically, if you can exploit the wind, I mean, as you probably know, albatross have been known to basically uh, go across the entire uh, Pacific, uh, barely flapping their wings uh, by taking advantage of the shear uh, uh, in the boundary layer. And so we are uh, using both uh, dynamic soaring and static soaring um, uh, ideas in order to uh, extend the range and endurance of the aircraft. Uh, my role in this is primarily in uh, measuring the wind. Now, one of the things that, um, if you look at the, uh, the aircraft, let's see, where's the, the aircraft, uh, this is where the, uh, the aero probe is, that's the, the multi-hole probe, and the sond is located in this uh, um, uh, pod here. The, um, the problem is not so much making the local measurement. We can, we can make high precision local measurements with the multi-hole probe. The problem, though, is if you, if you are seeking the inertial winds, so the wind with respect to the ground, the problem is not so much the local measurement, it's the, knowing the attitude of the aircraft. And so um, it, it becomes a problem of the autopilot, or at least the inertial measuring unit, and the sensing capabilities there. And so what we're trying to do is, is basically, <clears throat> excuse me, this is an example of some simulations that we've uh, been running to try to characterize the error. So we, we can get, if we can get an, uh, error bars on, the, um, on the, uh, the wind estimation and to uh, also be able to track uh, to determine the, uh, where the uncertainty, where it's propagating from, we can work backwards then. And all of this in keeping the instrument package inexpensive. So in, in all of this, we're not looking to uh, buy more expensive sensors, we're looking to uh, better understand the sensors that are available and to get a better uh, estimate of the attitude of the aircraft and thus the wind. So this is uh, from a, uh, in, in June thir uh, 2013, we, we had a one week deployment in the Pawnee National Grassland and this was actually on the first day. This is uh, a couple of supercells near uh, Cheyenne, Wyoming and here you see a gust front coming out. And so what we were doing was uh, looking to better understand the instruments that we were flying on the aircraft and so we mounted the, this is the wing from the Tempest right here that you see where that, there's that wind probe again and here's the sond. And it's mounted on top of a uh, National Severe Storms Lab uh, mobile mesonet. And so we were looking to do co-located measurements uh, of during this uh, one week deployment. And so this shows us here uh, uh, outside of Cheyenne with, and you can see the, the uh, contraption mounted there on the, uh, on the, on the top. So this is uh, uh, some results that Adam uh, has uh, uh, pulled from that, uh, that, that day's deployment. And in addition to comparing the two uh, physical measurements that were made by the, uh, this right here is uh, from the, uh, uh, the mesonet, and uh, the, these, this is the perturbation wind speed from the, uh, from the aircraft. And here's a plot of the uh, comparison, direct comparison data. We also uh, are, are doing, using computational fluid dynamics to model the flow around the mesonet, for instance, as you see right here, and looking at the location of the aeroprobe and the, uh, this is an RM Young uh, anemometer, and also plotting that simulation result on top, and you can see the, the type of uh, agreement we're getting there. So again, we're trying to better understand exactly what it is that we're measuring. 
Uh, this was a, uh, that, that short movie that you saw earlier where the aircraft was, uh, was being launched to intercept a gust front from a, uh, super, uh, a supercell. Well, this is the, uh, uh, Google, uh, the Google Earth image of that deployment. So the aircraft was actually launched from a location about here. So this is about uh, three miles. Let's see, this is about two miles here and then three miles along here. You can see the section line roads in the grassland. And so this is the, the trajectory of the aircraft. So we, we launched it, put it in an, an orbit, um, and the mesonet was sitting right about here at this corner right here. And so what we were looking to do is do a simultaneous uh, flight of the aircraft coordinated with the uh, mesonet on the ground. And so the uh, air, aircraft uh, paired up and they drove uh, into the, uh, uh, the uh, outflow here and then went north along this road also. And so this is, what this is is showing you um, the, uh, so the red um, arrow that you see right here, this is the mesonet uh, measurement of the, of the wind. Uh, the gust front had already passed. So we weren't, unfortunately we didn't get in the air before the gust front passes, so it's already passed. And this is the uh, mesonet uh, measuring the wind. So north is in this direction here, <coughs> east is in, in this direction. And the aircraft is in the air now, and this is the uh, wind measurement that it's making uh, and reporting down. So you'll see them pair up here in just a second and then drive along the, uh, the east-west road or, uh, in the east direction and then to the north. At this point, it was, about a th it was at 1,000 feet. And the, the, the certificate of authorization that we have, the COA that we have there, uh, and I'll show you this in just a moment, uh, a quick moment. <laughs> uh, the, uh, uh, at this location, we can fly it up to 1,000 feet. Uh, if we go further east, we can go up to 2,500 feet. And uh, so right in here, it dro we dropped it down to about 500 feet. And so it's, it's going in tandem with the, uh, with the mesonet. And, um, and you'll see the turn here. And now the wind is primarily behind it, so you can see that it's, uh, it, it, it rushes out ahead. And uh, it's, it's hard for you to keep track uh, uh, from the ground. So uh, let's go on to the next one here. So some of the results, uh, this is just a close-up of showing how we had this mounted here uh, on, the, on the aircraft. Uh, and so these are some of the results that Adam has, uh, has put together from that day, showing the uh, comparison of the relative humidity. Uh, and you can see the gust front passage. Uh, uh, actually, this is from the, uh, the, uh, the 15th. Uh, no, I take that back. This is from the, the 21st, but this is before we actually put the aircraft in the air. We, we literally intercepted the storm near Sterling, Colorado, and then we chased down the gust front from behind to try to get out in front of it so we'd get the airplane in the air. But of course, by the time we got the wing off of the, off of the mesonet, got it mounted and so forth, it had just passed us. And uh, actually, if I go to the, uh, and these are some more of the results that Adam's uh, showing the, the temperature tracking that, that's going on there. But this is the track, I won't run the video, but this is the track of the uh, gust front was moving literally uh, west, uh, east to west. And so we came in behind it. And just as we got to the, inter the boundary, uh, the uh, autopilot uh, it basically went out of range and we had to turn around and come back uh, because we weren't using a high gain antenna uh, for this particular deployment. Uh, one last uh, thing to show you here is uh, this is a recent deployment we did where we flew multiple aircraft. This was in the Pawnee National Grassland. We flew three aircraft. Tempest was not one of them. We used a surrogate. Uh, this is the, some of you are familiar with the X-8, the Skywalker X-8 here. This is the aeroprobe that we had mounted on that uh, for this particular uh, test we were doing. And this shows our ground station along with one of the Texas Tech uh, radar. And uh, I just wanted to show you uh, the launch. So we had two Skywalkers and one Data Hawk, and they were separated by about a half mile, about a quarter mile each. So here's the launch of this. Uh, so you can, the wind is blowing slightly. So we're getting in, in this one we were prepared. Uh, you can see the storm is coming from from the east, uh, from the west, uh, Fort Collins is over here, and it's, and it's moving out away from the mountains. And so we were in the air a good 10 minutes before the gust front arrived. So I'm going to move ahead. So the gust front. Uh, so there was not a whole lot to see other than these airplanes starting to struggle. <laughs> 
once the uh, the wind hits. But uh, there's a time last year that uh, we'll be able to see. This shows a storm, so we're looking to the west. And so the mount, <clears throat> excuse me, the front range is, is back here to the west, about 30, 30 miles. And uh, so you can see the, uh, the building of this storm. And we'll go a little bit beyond that. So now uh, this is the, the uh, actually showing, you can see from the, uh, this image here, there's the airplane right here flying, flying a little uh, ground uh, track there, and you can see the outflow coming from the storm, and it will intercept. And right here is the temperature. Uh, I believe that's temperature, right, Adam? This is the temperature, which shows that passage of that gust front. You can see that precipitous drop in the, in the temperature. And then this is the KA radar showing the uh, resolving that gust front as, as it's coming out. So I think I'm going to just quickly uh, wrap this up. This is some more of the comparison here from the three aircraft. And this is just to show you the, the, the certificates of authorization that we have. This is the one that, um, uh, for the flights in the grassland that we actually have. This is one that's in review right now in the Texas and Oklahoma panhandles that um, has already passed the, the safety review and we're waiting to receive that. And then this third one, which we will apply for as soon as we get the second one, uh, will give us uh, uh, operational capability along the front, uh, the high planes that you see right there. So I think I'll end it right here. Thank you, Brian. I think, uh